Hello and welcome to another Sunday Superversive live stream. I am your host Ben Wheeler and today we will be discussing the first years of the Reformation. I'll be focusing mostly on Martin Luther uh, as well as going through a whole bunch of different things uh, that we could talk about. Unfortunately uh, I am not as prepared as I would want to be. I fell asleep in my chair so yeah, that's how it is. Uh, I do want to thank you for joining. Anthony will be with us uh, when he uh, comes in. He is driving home uh, from some event. Uh, and I'm sure people will slowly wander in step by step as the stream continues. Uh, this is unfortunately going to be a bit drier than uh, you may expect uh, from the last one. Sadly... Uh, yeah, no, sometimes you just gotta do the practical stuff for this. I'm sure Anthony will have more for you later. So, first things first. When Martin Luther, uh, put up the 95 Theses on uh, an All Saints Church in Wittenberg in, uh, October 1517, uh, he started something that he didn't really expect to go as big as this. Uh, the the basic drive of what he was uh, going for uh, was not the split up of a church uh, from the Catholic Church, uh, which was something that people had a hard time imagining. Even the split of Orthodox and Catholic had certain, uh, shall we say, political niceties to it that allowed a certain amount of... Um, uh, how do I want to put it, authority to be had. Now, of course, a splinter from the Catholic Church has uh, similar papal authorities and uh, church fatherness and all that jazz, as it is a reforming of it. However, it has not gotten to that part. So, essentially, Martin Luther is a very educated man. He is not some dummy uh, who decided to post his favorite atheist meme. Hey, hey, Anthony. Uh, he is in chat. He will be with us soon. He did not say, huh, you know, what if the church didn't spend money on things and instead help the poor? You know, his, his arguments in the 95 Theses, if you listen to them, which I know I posted it up there uh, relatively soon. This is more for posterity's uh, sake than anything else. Uh... Anthony says he is still on the road. Uh, essentially, uh, where was all right. Uh, his arguments aren't, you know, what if the church spent money on the poor? It's what do the people think of this? If the Pope could at any time uh, release souls from purgatory, why doesn't he just do it because he loves the people? Uh, you know, the laity are going to say, hey, if the Pope can do it for free, why are we paying for it? You know, and so on and so forth. You know, if, if the best good is the love of God, as you say, you know, when selling these purgatories, uh, uh, get out of purgatory for money cards, um, why, why are we doing it to build St. Peter's Basilica, which is a thing of the earth and therefore not as good as God's love? So on and so forth. There's, a, there's some complexities to it, uh, and I am not as equipped as I should be to fully expound on the 95 Theses. But the 95 Theses aren't uh, scripture. I will, uh, by the way, by, do a uh, video on Exerge Domine uh, from Pope Leo X on Luther. So continuing on from this, uh, as he studied, uh, he came to his beliefs about um, the, excuse me, the worst part about recovering from a summer cold is the congestion. As he studied, uh, he came to certain knowledges and certain conclusions about how the Catholics were handling the, uh, excuse me, uh, justification issue. How were people saved? Was it by their works? Was it by faith? Was it because they got the get out of purgatory free card? Did, is it because they have certain choices and certain, uh, you know, faiths, uh, that, uh, Excuse me. Certain faiths that allow them to receive salvation. 
uh, though I'm using very poor wording for it. Uh, it says here in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, New King James, uh, for those who can't handle the poetry of the King James. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Uh, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Which, <coughs> depending on your denomination, is a fun verse indeed. But the key here is verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You combine these things up with other, much more complicated verses. Uh, he came to the conclusion that that is why faith alone makes someone just and fulfills the law. Faith, faith is that which brings the Holy Spirit through the merits of Christ. This is his writing. Uh, faith, and this is quoting from the Info Galactic, Faith for Luther was a gift from God. The experience of being justified through faith was, again quoting him, as though I had been born again. Uh, he says here, uh, let me just make sure, yes, that is the right quote. Luther says, the first and chief article is this, Jesus Christ, our God and Lord, died for our sins and was raised again for our justification, Romans 3, 24 through 25. He alone is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John 1, 29, and God has laid, him the iniquity, laid on him the iniquity of us all, Isaiah 53, 6. All have sinned and are justified freely without their own works and merits by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus in his blood. Romans 3, 23 through 25. Uh, this, is nece this is necessary to believe. This cannot be otherwise acquired or grasped by any work, law, or merit. Therefore, it is clear and certain that this faith alone justifies us. Nothing of this article can be yielded or surrendered even though heaven and earth and everything else falls. So, you have these ideas going through his head. Now, as I mentioned in the previous uh, live stream, the most important part of Christianity is salvation. Whether or not we are saved, the death of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. The reason why we say these things is because... There is no point in being a Christian outside of salvation. I might as well be a pagan. I might as well be a Buddhist. If I cannot be assured of my salvation, but rather because I disrespected a priest or I uh, there was nobody there to uh, provide final unction, ultimate unction, eh. uh, the, the last rites, rather, uh, to hear my last confession, you know, I might damn myself. I might be in purgatory for longer, not through any fault of my own. My faith could be truly genuine, but if I take the wrong actions, that faith is thus rendered very powerless. Uh, ultimately, let's see here, how do I want to put it? Uh, essentially, there was no answer, really, from the authority uh, for a while. Uh, he was most delayed, uh, but then the big thing, let's see here, excuse me, the big thing from the Pope is the Exerge Domine. Like I said, I fell asleep, I shouldn't have done this stuff, so I'm a little bit out of sorts compared to what I usually am. Essentially, Luther ended up being uh, questioned uh, by a man by the name of Cardinal uh, Cahatan. Uh, essentially, they were disputing with each other over the right to uh, sell indulgences. Again, indulgences provide a gap or a tr uh, tripping stone over the idea of whether or not a man is saved. Therefore, it is worth arguing over and dying over. Uh, <coughs> Luther eventually just started going into hiding. Fortunately, he had certain uh, uh, friends who kept him protected. Uh, however, this led to his argument with Johann Eck. Uh, this is June and July. He disputed with, uh, as Eck disputed with other people. Uh, and uh, Luther, let's see here. What was it? Oh. Uh... 
basically, what is wrong with my keyboard? This isn't my best work, but that's okay. That's all right. Long story short, uh, Eck branded Luther, again, uh, reading from Info Galactic, a new John Huss, uh, and essentially became Luther's arch enemy. Uh, in the paper bull, uh, Eck Surge Domine, which followed uh, a little bit of time after. Remember, this is the 15th and four, uh, 16th century. Things take a very long time to distribute. I'm pretty sure the Pope didn't hear about the 95 Theses until 1518, maybe even 1519, and then, you know, you just have to go through there. Um, the Exerge Domine uh, was more or less a warning of uh, uh, excommunication, unless he re recanted. 41 sentences drawing, uh, f drawn from his writing, including the 95 Theses, within 60 days. Uh, discontinued on, and he Luther was excommunicated by Pope Leo X on the 3rd of January, 1521, uh, which has its own bull, the Deset Ro uh, Romanum Pontificum. The next major event is the Diet of Worms. Uh, Johann Eck, uh, was uh, essentially the prosecutor. Uh, there were some very important people presiding. Emperor Charles V at the top, uh, Prince Frederick III, Elector of Saxony, who uh, was also very important within the Holy Roman Empire, one of the strongest uh, states within it, uh, essentially was Luther's protector. Uh, Johann Eck, presented Luther with copies of writings, uh, and if, you know, he stood by them, and so on and so forth. Uh, Luther responded, Unless I am convinced by the testimony of scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust in either the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God, I cannot and will not recant anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. Eck responded as such. Uh, Martin, there is no one of the heresies which have torn the, to the bosom of the church which has not derived its origin from the various interpretation of scripture. The Bible itself is an arsenal whence each innovator has drawn his deceptive arguments. It was with biblical texts that Pelagius and Arius maintained their doctrine. Arius, for instance, found the negation of the eternity of the word, an eternity which you admit in this verse of the New Testament. Joseph knew not of his wife until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he said in the same way that you say that this passage enchained him. When the uh, fathers of the Council of Constance condemned this heresy of John Huss, the Church of Jesus Christ is only the community of the elect, they condemned an error for the Church, like a good mother, embraces within her arms all who bear the name of Christian, all who are called to enjoy the celestial beatitude. Now, from a modern perspective, as in from a perspective totally removed from the Catholic side of things, who is not a Catholic and who deeply studies the Word and who ensures that by his rejection of Catholicism that he is still a Christian, i.e., you know, what I am studying, what I'm doing, Arius denied that Jesus was God, or he denied he was fully man, or he played around with the Trinity. And by that, I'm actually making a joke, and I'm saying that it was a very, not confused, but it was a very confusing heresy. The Trinity itself flows uh, a lot of wrong thinking. Uh, it is best to say, you know, the, the, the trigram, you know, God is and is not Jesus Christ. God is and is not the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is and is not the Holy Spirit, you know, is and is not God, so on and so forth. Because otherwise, you will hit an absolute minefield. Uh, but what he did was he actually spread it deeply into uh, the Germanic tribes, and he used Scripture when he could, to justify his position. Now, the scriptures at that point were not as freely available. There was no printing press. You could not go to a Walmart and find yourself a nice Bible. 
Uh, but it essentially it essentially removed the ability of many people to judge rightly about the state of Jesus Christ. And the state of Jesus Christ shows up later on in heresies I mentioned in previous episodes, like the Monophysites, who said that God only had, Jesus only had one nature, which is, of course, incorrect. Uh, though, I don't want to get into it. Uh, <laughs> Pelagius uh, is someone I haven't mentioned, but essentially he opposed predestination and asserted strong will, for, uh, sorry, free will. Uh, and he was accused of denying the need for divine aid in performing good works. Uh, I've not really studied uh, the Pelagian heresy much. It's, eh, you know, it doesn't really show up as much as any as uh, things like Arianism and whatnot. Uh, he was declared a heretic. Uh, let's see here. He was British born. I'm just kind of looking here. Uh, Yeah, no, there's just not much interest uh, with it. He more or less fought with uh, Jerome and Augustine of Hippo. Uh, but essentially, he used the scripture to justify his works, as Eck said. Uh, the responses that were made against Pelagius and others, which uh, are actually, like, now that I'm reading it, are beyond the scope of this live stream and interesting in a side way. Uh, are many and varied. The Catholic Church is very much invested in keeping a certain amount of uh, homodoxy, orthodoxy, uh, within itself. The problem is, is that they establish themselves at, uh, for that homodoxy uh, within very stringent word games. In other words, you deny Christianity if you deny that you are part of the universal ap apostolic church even though a right reading of scripture will say that all saved are part of the same church. That is undeniable. Every Christian is part of the same church. The problem is, is that they position themselves, and Eck is positioning himself with his argument here, uh, specifically, the church of Jesus Christ is only the community of the elect. Uh, they condemn an error for the church, like a good mother embraces with her arms all who bear the name of Christian, who are, <coughs> excuse me, I hate being sick, uh, excuse me, oh my goodness, oh no, still working, still working, okay, pardon me, I thought my microphone had failed for a moment, so, that's what he's doing, he is saying that as Luther is excommunicated, he is uh, excommunicated from the Catholic Church. He is no longer a Christian to them. Uh, he refused uh, to recant his writings. He's also quoted to saying, Here I stand, I can do no other. Recent scholars, probably Catholics, who knows, uh, says that uh, uh, they, to, the, the, the depiction of events to be unreliable. Uh, but who knows? I'm not one of those people who's like, uh, you gotta have the absolute truth of historical events. I expect the absolute truth out of scripture, not out of men's events of things. Honestly, the cooler the better. Uh, but going back to this stuff, he makes a very clear state, uh, Eck, that is, makes a very clear statement with his argument against Luther. That, despite the fact that Luther l uses scripture... It is not enough to justify Luther's actions within or without the church. And it doesn't matter, you know, quite the details of it. It doesn't matter how many scriptures he brings. There is an official right thinking when it comes to these doctrines. And Luther is an error of them. It doesn't matter that Luther could using scripture as he did in the 95 theses uh specifically say how and when uh salvation sorry uh sorry the arguments f uh for and against uh per uh, uh indulgences it is that indulgences have been set up as the right thinking therefore they cannot be argued against even with scripture now, 
certain things like Scola Scriptura hasn't quite shown up yet as we would know them today. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, in the end, uh, the Edict of Wor Worms was set out. Uh, and uh, let me see if I can get a bit of a text here. Ah, there we go. Luther concluded by saying, Unless I am convinced by the testimony of scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust in either of the Pope or councils alone, for they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot or will not and will not recant anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. Quoting that again, that is a fantastic quote uh it ended though with the edict of worms which says for this reason we forbid anyone from this time forward to dare either this is charles v by the way saying either by words or deeds to receive defense sustain or favor said martin luther on the contrary we want him to be apprehended and punished as a notorious heretic as he deserves to be brought personally before us or to be securely guarded until those who have captured him inform us, <coughs> whereupon we will order the appropriate manner of proceeding against said Luther, who will help in his capture and will be rewarded generously for their good work. <coughs> Here's a good summary of the events. On a theological level, Luther had challenged the absolute authority of the Pope over the Church by maintaining that the doctrine of indulgences as authorized and taught by the Pope was wrong. Luther maintained that salvation was by faith alone, without reference to good works, alms, penance, or the Church's sacraments. Luther maintained that the sacraments were a means of grace, meaning that while grace was imparted through the sacraments, the cr credit for the action belonged to God and not the individual. He had challenged the authority of the church by maintaining that all doctrines and dogmata of the church not found in scripture should be discarded. <sighs> yep. So, in the end, uh, the elector of Saxony, uh, Frederick III, uh, took Luther uh, by night and by storm uh, to Wartburg Castle. Uh, ultimately, uh, Luther would use the time to work as well as uh, uh, send out letters and stuff like that until 1522 when he returned to Wittenberg. Uh, <laughs> uh, he preached sermons uh, and he said, During my absence, Satan has entered my sheep sheepfold, and that is to say, Wittenberg and committed ravages which I cannot repair by writing, but only by my personal presence and the living word. Uh, he continued to uh, preach sermons, saying, uh, let me just make sure, uh, do you know what the devil thinks uh, when he sees men use, the violence to propagate, use violence to propagate the gospel? He sits with folded arms behind the fire of hell and says, with malignant looks and frightful grin, ah, how wise these madmen are to play my game. Let them go on, I shall reap the benefit, I delight in it. But when he sees the word running and contending alone on the battlefield, he shudders and shakes, shakes for fear. Uh, everyone was pretty happy with this. <laughs> and so on, so forth. Uh, part of the things that were happening is that let me just pull up some information real quick. Is that the uh, pe uh, German Peasants' War was starting to build up. Like I said, uh, these things take a bit of time. And throughout it, for the next couple years, until uh, 1524 and 1525, violence and rhetoric was escalating. And the people were organizing. Essentially, it was a popular uprising. Uh, these, these things never end well, and the Germans Peasants Reformation uh, it did not go well uh, and they were pretty much massacred it depopulated an absolute immense amount of the German countryside and ended uh, with a lot of deaths however things uh, went forward 
and it was sort of a part of it. They were unhappy with the order that had been put upon them. And even though they made a poor choice, as you know, Martin Luther very clearly denounced them as uh, in the sermon. Well, not them specifically, but violence in general for the work of God. Uh, you know, he did not do it. He did not. He could not. Uh, you know, accept what they were doing. Ultimately, he wrote the Twelve Articles in 1525. Uh, essentially, he wrote some solutions, uh, but ultimately. Uh, including removing inheritance tax, uh, as well as some protections uh, for the peasants. But, you know, ultimately the peasants were to return to their people, uh, to their, uh, you know, leadership and nobility, uh, which has a certain amount to it, a certain amount of truth to it. Going forward, he married a nun and set about organizing his church, uh, having uh, some catechisms and more. Uh, there is a document called the Augsburg Confession. Uh, it was written 25th of June, 1530, uh, and is essentially designed as a document uh, to uh, basically declare what they believed in in as clear a fashion as they could. Uh, I will obviously I will be doing a, a small uh, recitation of the Oxford Confession uh, later on. There is not much there that can be offended by, uh, except for the fact that they call themselves Lutherans, and as a evangelical low church Protestant, ah, uh, uh, that's popery, papacy, Lutheranism. Uh, they have quite a few very clear and very homodox uh, teachings with what the the Catholics have in such a, uh, no, not Catholics, hold on, with right-thinking Christian values. There we go. Uh, these things like, number one, Lutherans believe in the triune God and reject other interpretations, Arianism, non-Trinitarianism, etc., regarding the nature of God. Or, number two, original sin. Lutherans believe that the nature of man is sinful, described as being without fear of God, without trust of God, and with concupiscence. Uh, sin is redeemed through baptism and the Holy Spirit. Though I don't really agree with the baptism thing, uh, as they're describing it. Uh, there are some things that, you know, modern people in, in evangelical cir circles don't take anymore. For example, like infant baptism. But they have it here. No? Sorry, one of my documents just closed on me. Uh, Luther continues on. He meets up with Philip Melanchthon, and he begins translating the Bible into German. Uh, he completed the Old Testament in 1534, and he worked through uh, many other problems and wrote many letters. Uh... Essentially, like, there were uh, translations of the Bible going forward. Even uh, William Tyndale uh, and others uh, used, oh my goodness, I can't remember his name, used previous versions of uh, the English Wycliffe's Bible, but they also relied upon Luther's Bible and other versions to create something more through it. The, excuse me, the printing press was a major tool of, of these things that are going on. Uh, the, it spread the 95 Theses and more faster <coughs> than could be expected, uh, you know, from previous times. Jan Hus and Wycliffe and others were limited by the fact that they could not mass produce their documents. Luther could. Luther could spread out as much as he could, and he did. Uh, though, uh, personally, I favor his hymns uh, above his translation of the Bible, as I can't read German. A Mighty Fortress is Our God is absolutely fantastic. Uh, everyone knows it. A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It's fantastic. Ultimately, uh, the ideas of what Luther had done would spread to Melanchthon 
uh, to John Calvin and others. Uh, essentially, it opened the floodgate. Reformers had come and gone in the past. Quite often. All the time. But the thing is, is that they never really took hold outside of their city. Or outside of their immediate area, is more accurate. Wycliffe was a, a very scholarly attempt at it. Uh, John Huss was a bit of a, you know, more of a popular revolt, and it spread out more than the other ones. Uh, but again, he was limited by his uh, technology at hand. Ultimately, uh, because of the... Excuse me. Because of the events that Martin Luther had unwittingly set forward, Reformation could come faster and faster. And again, the goal at this time was Reformation. They were not looking to destroy the church. They were not looking to create a new church. They were not looking to do anything more than to work with the guidelines given to them to create something that would have brought people to Christ within the rules given. The more the Pope struggled against them, the more he wrote his bulls, and the more he attacked those who worked with Luther and others, the more uh, it caused problems. The reason why the Germans' peasant revolt is often peasant peasant revolt is often connected to Luther and so on and so forth. Is that his actions caused a gap uh, in power that the peasants decided, oh well, if they can, so on and so forth. Not that I agree that this is an entirely a a fault of uh, Luther or anyone, but rather that. It was inevitable, it's just they provided the rhetorical excuse. In a similar way, uh, the Crusades were often, ah, we will retake Jerusalem. But first, we're going to destroy every pirate in our way. It's like, is it Jerusalem is the goal, or is it end to the Mediterranean Muslim piracy? Uh, it's both, but, you know, the propaganda said Jerusalem. Uh, Calvin came on the scene in 1536, uh, and he wrote uh, Institutional Christianae, or the Institutes of the Christian Religion. He was connected to quite a few of them, uh, and mostly, he's one of those guys is that, I disagree with Calvin, therefore, I don't study him as much as I did Luther and others. The, the, let me see here, excuse me. He went through some things, and he really shows up in Geneva in the 1940s, where things get a little hairy and a lot of people die. It's quite interesting to me to see that ultimately any time a, a reformer takes, takes themselves out of the spiritual leadership of a church and into a real political leadership, it ends very badly. Ultimately, though, Calvin remained true to the faith uh, even if I do disagree on predestination and other things, uh, though he's much exaggerated in his predestination. Uh, and he became a leadership leader of the church, uh, different from Martin Luther. There was also a man named Zwingli. Excuse me. He was uh, mostly involved in the Swiss Reformation. Or the Reformation in Switzerland, I guess, you know. I find it weird. Sometimes they'll say, like, German Reformation or Ref uh, Radical Reformation, but then it's the Reformation in Switzerland. Even though they had very important ministers within Switzerland who had their own authority, who had their own, you know, scriptures and so... Not their own scriptures, excuse me. Their own, um... who had, you know, authority and power and often preached very strong messages and gained a gathering. Uh, yeah. There was uh, uh, differences within Switzerland. Essentially, because of how they're divided up, like the United States of America is divided up into states, they have to separate up into cantons. Much like the uh, uh, Holy Roman Empire... Every, every canton basically chose whether they were Protestant or Catholic. Uh, 
he he died interestingly uh essentially let's see here i'm trying to get a good detail for you guys because i always knew he died on the battlefield but i'm trying to get a good storyline for it essentially uh they declared war on uh zurich uh and they fought each other Zwingli uh, considered himself, as this says, an infogalactic, first and foremost a soldier of Christ, uh, second a defender of his country, the Confederation, Switzerland, uh, and third the leader of the city, Zurich, where he lived for the previous 12 years. He died at 47, uh, not for Christ nor the, for the Confederation, but for Zurich. Uh, Luther is recorded as saying, they say that Swingley recently died, if his error had prevailed, we would have perished in our church with us. It was under the judgment of God that was always a proud people. The others, the papists, will probably also be dealt with by our Lord God. And Rasmus wrote, We are freed from great fear by the death of the two preachers, Zwingli and Oclamatius, uh, whose fate was wrought an incredible change in the mind of many, the wonderful hand of God on high. Uh, Oclamatius. I don't even know who that is. This is the first time I've, I've heard of him. Uh, let's see here. Huh. He barely even has an article about him, too. Anyway. Uh, Zwingli, uh, does have a few problems, at least from the low church perspective. Uh, he had some ideas about Eucharist and baptism. He denied that actual sacrifice occurred during Mass. Uh, arguing that Christ made the sacrifice only once and for eternity. Oh, my. Uh, hence, the Eucharist was a memorial of the sacrifice. Uh, and he continued to talk about it. Uh, let's see here. I'm looking for something. <laughs> uh, Anthony, how are you doing? You thought you could escape me. I've been listening. There, there was a small, around like ten minute gap as I entered my house and set up my laptop. But I've been listening. Good, 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 good. <sighs> Either way, back to Martin Luther. Excuse me. Things continued on. He mostly focused on uh, organizing the church, making sure that the theology was written down and distributed, as well as, you know, guiding people uh, through some things. Uh, there's a whole lot of fun stuff uh, that we can talk about. Uh, his supposed anti-Semitism. Um, various other events uh bigamy uh of somebody else uh who was trying to marry somebody uh which i think is is like most medieval drama kind of funny uh but weirdly leading to death uh ultimately martin luther continued on doing his best uh until he uh started having infections and worse uh I'm of the opinion uh, that, and like, this article is of the opinion that he became much more ruder as his health declined uh, to the point where his wife said, Dear husband, you are too rude. And he responded, They are teaching me to be rude. Uh, which is crotchety old man energy, uh, if there ever was one. Uh, let's see here. He died in 1546, uh, 62 years old. Uh, his last written statement uh, was, we are beggars, uh, in Latin, uh, in German, but the rest is in Latin, uh, which, <laughs> all right, one, no one can understand Virgil's bucolics unless he had been a shepherd for five years, no one can understand Virgil's georgics unless he has been a father, farmer for five years. No one can understand Cicero's letters, or so I teach, unless he has busied himself with the affairs of some prominent state for 20 years. 
and 3. Know that no one uh, can have indulged the holy writers sufficiently unless he has governed churches for a hundred years with the prophets, such as Elijah and Elisha, John the Baptist, Christ, and the apostles. Do not assail this divine Aeneid, rather prostrate, revere the ground it treads. We are beggars. This is true. Ultimately, uh, as, excuse me, ultimately Lutheranism spread and could not be destroyed, uh, despite many attempts by the church uh, for it. It spread prominently to Sweden, where it uh, became one of the defenders of the Protestant faith, uh, and spread, uh, remains the mainstay of, Ger of Germany to this day, though some states are Catholic and others are Protestant, of other varieties. Uh, Lutheranism remains a, a Christian force in the world. Sadly, uh, to take the long-term view outside the purview of this stream, uh, uh, Lutheranism is much declined uh, from what it was before, uh, which is a great pity. Uh, whatever Lutheran uh, Luther was attempting through his reformation of the church, uh, he either through how do I want to put it? There are within the Catholic Church certain rules and laws that prevent deep problems within the uh, scripture being taught by the Pope. There are not the same restrictions on Lutheran churches. In other words... Uh, while I have heard a Catholic priest from the pulpit deny the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, you see, the miracle was that they shared. Uh, <coughs> uh, Lutherans also uh, are more than willing to preach the message and other severe issues that are accosting the church uh, to this day. While it is unfortunate, it is more important to focus on what Luther did for the Reformation and Protestantism in general. Even though my church, for example, never thinks of Catholics, the only reason I interact with Catholics is because I am surrounded by Catholics uh, and will continuously be surrounded by Catholics because they dominate art world and Christian thought quite often. Uh, it, it allowed certain things to be codified. Luther's purpose wasn't to, you know, kick the Pope in the balls and run off laughing. It was specifically to codify Christianity after it had been moved off target. The final straw being the sale of indulgences. There were issues going through it that men like Wycliffe and John Huss brought up that I discussed in the previous stream. However, without the printing press, without certain things that uh, Luther did as a preacher, as somebody who studied the word, who translated the gospel into German, who made sure that the gospel was preached without flinching you would not have the same issues today you can even see it with men like Zwingli uh, and Calvin at Geneva and others where great disasters happened when a Protestant rather than focusing on preaching the gospel but instead became enamored of statecraft or thought himself something that he was not that they died for it or Many other people died for it. Uh, you can also see similar parallels in men like Savonarola and other certain, uh, what we would call, I guess, charismatic uh, heretics who would come up, or non-heretics, uh, who would come up at different times uh, within certain cities of Italy and, and England and others and lead into strange thoughts and strange events, most notably the Cathars. They denied scripture and essentially added on a gospel of perfection. There was no case of that here with Martin Luther's church. There was no added heresy. 
while I disagree with things like the Eucharist and infant baptism and others, that certain things of that, even if said differently, was sacramentally in keeping with Roman Catholic doctrine. The addition of sola fides and the removal of indulgences, which was so offensive to the Pope, was not over whether God rules in heaven, that Jesus Christ was both man and God at the same time, or the actions and existence of the Holy Spirit, that is to say certain people in different heresies at the time said it doesn't exist, uh, were not present. The disagreement of brothers over the wording of the Bible is not as important as the issues of salvation of faith. When Martin Luther makes his arguments, he is disputing from the Bible with Scripture to back him up, and there is Scripture uh, quoted or referenced, yeah. excuse me, in um, in the Ninety Five Theses, in some of the arguments I made that quotes I had earlier, uh, in the first and chief article is this: uh, he quotes the Scripture one, two, three four, five times uh, with deliberate uh, uh, references next to them. That should be the model for how the scripture is treated, not the exception of the rule. When uh, Eck provides his counter-argument to certain things, he does not quote scriptures in the same way. Rather, he uses it to mark off the heresies of others, but does not defend against his arguments with the same amount of scripture. His argument was not, hey, this is what it actually means. It was, you are not in keeping with the church. Correct yourself. Ultimately, in our uh, stream that we'll be doing at a later date, we will be focusing on uh, the Council of Trent and its uh, uh, effect on the Christian population. Uh, but that's not yet. Uh, and even though I've been skipping around the timeline, I wanted to make sure to hit certain points of Martin Luther's life and his arguments with Johann Eck and others uh, throughout it. The importance isn't on him kicking himself away from the Catholic Church. The importance is actually on how the Catholic Church uh, responded to dissent. Like I said earlier, I will read out the Exerge Domine, uh, which d is, goes far beyond what you think of as the 95 Theses. Martin Luther being declared an outlaw and forcing certain politicians, that is to say nobles, rulers, kings, elector princes, as in of Saxony, uh, to make different choices caused further political divisions than the ones who were already there. Charles V was a defender of the faith, that is the Roman Catholic faith. He did not separate it out, and he was not one of those people who, uh, like uh, Henry uh, II, who disputed with the Catholic Church. However, oh, that's right. He was a Habsburg. I think he was a Habsburg. Was he a Habsburg? I think he was. Eh. Point is, <laughs> of course he was a Habsburg. Uh... The point is, is that by exasperating the political divisions between the Holy Roman Empire, further conflict could no longer be avoided. The choices made to stamp on Luther when he had already gone too far essentially guaranteed the Reformation. And it was a guarantee that could not be taken back after the Council of Trent. Until that point, though, the reformers would spread out and spread like wildfire. The hunger of the people and the joy 
for receiving the gospel was clear. God doesn't, in the past, the gospel, how do I want to put it? In absence of any Christian thought, any old heresy will do. Arian found great success among the Germans, and then they became Christian once they actually heard the gospel. But within Christian culture, where the Bible is accessible and can be understood, whether or not you've also read Jerome or Augustine of Hippo, the focus on Jesus Christ absolutely spreads like wildfire. It spreads because people have an innate hunger for Jesus Christ, for salvation, for the removal of guilt for their sins, to enter heaven. I have not argued against purgatory particularly. I have not argued against uh, other events of scripture that Catholics hold true. That is not the purpose here. The purpose is to show that Luther did not separate himself from scripture for a vindictive gotcha, right? This wasn't a YouTube video where he's like, hey guys, Luther here. Today I'm going to talk about why the Pope is not goaded with the sauce, no cap. Whatever the Zoomers say. I don't understand the Zoomers anymore. I'm old. Uh, and it's happened. I don't understand what the kids are saying, and it's scary. He made specific, deliberate arguments. The Eck and others did make their own counter-arguments. But I firmly believe that the further that man falls away from Scripture with his spiritual arguments, the more the cause of Christ is distanced from. Luther's heirs might be rainbow-wearing heathen who are deliberately sabotaging everything good Luther did. But I am of the opinion that is more because Satan hated that Luther shattered the stranglehold of the Catholic Church over theology. Satan hates that man can read scripture for himself because that means that man will no longer be deceived by any old person who says they have a vision from God. Men like David Koresh at Waco were heretics, were wrong. But the fault doesn't lie with Luther that they have a following, that all this things, oh, well, if the Reformation hadn't happened, we wouldn't have these cults, we wouldn't have these, you know, constantly schismatic and religions and all that jazz. No. The, the man, David Koresh, and all these other cult leaders who should prop up every now and then would simply become priests and have their own congregation. Or if they wanted to, they could join uh, some other church or some other religion and do the same. Religious authority is authority, and it invites corruption. As we'll see, and as we'll go forward, I only hope that the Lutherans purge themselves of their uh, heretical elements. But like the leadership of the Catholic Church, like the Southern Baptist Convention, I do not have much hope uh, for their end result. Uh, they have their own Lavender Mafia, they have their own issues. Uh, and I'm sure it will end with yet another schism. Fortunately, though, these schisms, even though it was started by Luther uh, so long ago, uh, tend to force out the bad and bring in the good, the new, the beautiful, the true. Ultimately, uh, Luther is to be praised for his choices, for his bravery, uh, to defy uh, these events, even though he knew that whenever they mentioned uh, John Huss, they were essentially threatening him with the death penalty. And for the other reformers, even though they get pretty wacky, and I recommend everyone do a reading uh, romp through Infogalactic, 
uh, seeing how they lived their lives, and especially how they died. Uh, the holiness of them uh, sometimes absolutely shines through. Uh, men like, in the future, like John Knox, who prayed fervently daily for the salvation of the Scottish people, and in general of people everywhere, uh, absolutely shine forth throughout history in my mo own mind, and I hope in yours as well, as examples of the faith. Ultimately, if I am drawn before the magistrates uh, for posting Doug on the internet saying I hate the Antichrist, I should be able to defend that and say, uh, you know, here I stand, I can do no other. Or rather, uh, to shout uh, and say, I hate the Antichrist. Uh, and I will hate no other but the Antichrist. Uh, I love the Lord God, and I will not say anything other. If men stood up to people like Luther did, stood up and made sure that the gospel was preached and that the evil men who come in to disturb and to disrupt the uh, people's study and education. Sorry, I lost track thanks to the thing. If no one is there to rebuke those who lead the people astray, then the gospel is worthless. Uh, I made a joke uh, earlier that uh, they had a new teacher in Sunday school just for a week uh, because the pastor was feeling ill. Uh, and he said, ah, you know, I don't see any tomatoes yet. I'm like, oh, don't worry. If you start preaching heresy, you don't have to worry about the tomatoes. I'll throw you from the pulpit. And it's that sort of spirit that we need, the spirit of just being for the gospel at whatever cost. If they're deceiving the young, if they're deceiving the people, it, the threats are always the same. They're threatening us with a fast ticket to heaven and martyrdom. And even though it will be suffering in this life to be martyred, it is worth it if it is for Christ. Anthony. Anthony. You there? Yes, I am. I didn't uh, realize you had finished completely. Okay. Uh, Not a problem. I'm at 50. I'm at, I'm at 58. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's basically an hour, and I spent most of the day asleep in my chair. This is important, Anthony. This is important. I'm well rested now, but I'm unprepared. The irony. Yeah, it's uh, it's an important conversation for people to have. So, <laughs> I will say, uh, as a moment, I guess, of full disclosure, I do not have notes as I did, like I did last time, simply did not have the time to make them. However, I am probably about as prepared for this one as last one, because it was a lot of the same reading material, just, you know, further in, and I did read all of it, so... Uh, I guess I'll start. So, in terms of this whole conver of this whole conversation, in a sense, Ben and I are talking about slightly different things that don't always contradict each other. This isn't to say that we don't disagree on important points. We obviously do, and we'll get into that. However, uh, what I am trying to get at is why a Catholic could know the facts of the Reformation and still say, after hearing them, saying, yes, there was a lot of corruption, this, that, the other thing, uh, why you would still, at the end of that, go, but I also think that people should be Catholic. Ben is... Are you there, Anthony? Anthony? Did I lose connection? No? Uh, I believe we have lost sweet, uh, tender Anthony.
Stand by, guys. We are having technical difficulties. Uh, I am connected to the... Okay, internet. now can you hear me? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. My yeah. internet died for a moment. I might actually, in the middle of this, I might connect to my phone. All right. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're good. Yeah. I had to readjust your volume. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So, and my Discord, like, froze and every weird stuff happened, which I'm pretty sure is the internet connection. But anyway, so going back to what I was saying, I'll repeat, I'll go back a little bit and repeat it. So the point that Ben is trying to make was that the Protestant reformers were motivated by the salvation of souls. Now, obviously, that isn't the only point he's making. I mean, it's a complex discussion. Yeah. But that's one of the main points, and that is something that I'm happy to concede. I don't have an entirely negative view of the Reformers, or even of Luther, though I certainly have a more negative view than Ben does for obvious reasons. My point is that the Catholic Church is why, you know, I'm trying to show people why you could hear all of this stuff about Luther, the Reformation, the corruption in the Church, and things like that, and why you could still come out the other end and go, but I still think people should Catholic. Now, these two things are not entirely at cross-purposes with each other. You know, a Protestant could hear my arguments and go, okay, I can understand why somebody would still be Catholic, even if I don't agree. A Catholic could hear the Protestant side of the debate, and of or of this, uh, the larger debate, I should say, and say, okay, yeah, I agree that the Reformers were trying to address genuinely real, genuine issues and who and their primary motivation, for the most part, uh, was the salvation of souls, right? So those two things aren't necessarily at cross purposes with each other. Now, with that said, there are individual things that we are absolutely at cross purposes. I am not one of those people, and I have had these discussions, and I find them incredibly frustrating, who thinks that there are no important differences between Protestantism and Catholicism. There absolutely are. Uh, anytime that anybody has that discussion, this includes... I will sometimes get Protestants who agree with me on the opposite side of important issues, but who at least agree with me that the issues are important. So, with all of that background in mind, I guess that's what I'm trying to say here. What I am going to try and do for my side of this is present the facts of the Reformation as I understand them. Now, I will freely admit that I have the infogalactic page on the, inf on the Reformation in front of me. I do have the basic facts of it. The Anthony. Anthony, no. This is cursed. Cursed, I tell ye. I will try and give an interpretation of events from the Catholic perspective, you know. Do I think that what they're saying is right? Do I think that what they're saying is wrong? Do I think that it is theologically accurate? Do I think it helped or harmed the church? Stuff like that. So, with that in mind, we left off our story right getting into the very beginning of the Protestant Reformation. So, there is this man, and his name is Martin Luther. You might have heard of him. Uh, who was Martin Luther? He was an Augustinian monk. Uh, as far as we know, he was, an, he was a very holy monk who took it very seriously. He struggled with what we would call in the modern day, and might have called at the time, I haven't checked it, what the terminology being used was, he struggled with what we would call in the modern day, at least, scrupulosity. So, scrupulosity, for those who don't know, is a Catholic term for the phenomenon where you hyper-focus on your sins and you become worried about your salvation and your sight in God's eyes to the point where it's unhealthy, right? Obviously, there's a point where that's a good thing, but it gets unhealthy. Luther was certainly suffering from what we would call scrupulosity. And Martin Luther... Uh, he kind of came away from this. He, he claims, I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but he claimed that he was freed from this plague of scrupulosity when he realized that nothing that he did actually mattered, more or less. I am uh, vastly oversimplifying, obviously, but he was very worried that he wasn't good enough to reach heaven. Then he went, oh, I don't need to be good enough. Christ is good enough, and Christ will help me reach heaven as long as I have faith in him. So that kind of became a centerpiece of his theology later on. Now, Martin Luther, what started the Protestant Reformation? Well, first there was that, 
that uh, realization in him. That was one of the things that started his road to what became the Protestant Reformation. Uh, the second thing that started it was that he had to make a trip to Rome on behalf of the Augustinian monks, and he was shocked by the corruption of Rome, uh, supposedly, anyway. So he claims Rome was so corrupt that it scandalized him. So, at the time, indulgences were going around. So what are indulgences? Now, I will first point out that it is entirely true and accurate and can be very well, and is very well sourced, that indulgences were absolutely being abused by the church at the time. Uh, there is no doubt of this. Uh, the One of the archbishops, it is well known, the archbishop who hired Johann Tetzel to collect indulgences in the region of Germany where Luther lived, uh, that archbishop had bought his archbishopric by siphoning off money from indulgences. So, what are indulgences? The simplest way of describing it, I did describe this last stream as well, but the simplest way of describing it is the church, claiming that it has the power to bind and loose, as given in the Gospels, uh, is time off of purgatory off of purgatory now we're not going to debate purgatory here that is literally worth its own stream and possibly one day but it is. yeah anyway i am absolutely like i i refuse i'm just not going to debate purgatory right now because it's such a complicated subject uh Ooh. and a fascinating one for that matter but anyway i will mention it though because it's relevant to what indulgences are in my explanation so the church would say, given our power to bind and loose, we're going to say that certain good deeds can be attached to certain spiritual benefits. And this spiritual benefit is time out of purgatory. Now, the church would later clarify that time is uh, probably misleading. I think I am sure that at the time, if you were really to dig into what they were saying, they would point out that the time was meant something, not as a metaphor, but metaphor isn't right but since we don't really know that purgatory is temporal in the classic sense it would be more like so one day off purgatory or whatever the equivalent would be eternity wise something like that but all of these nuances are completely lost on the people who are listening to it right right it just right. no no and to be honest i don't think that the temporal image of purgatory is necessarily a bad one like i think that it has as much possibility being true as the purgatory as process view, purgatory as place view, you know, all sorts of things like this. The point being that this was what the indulgences at the time were. It was you do something that a good deed, a good work, in this case giving alms, and then the church, using her power to bind and loose, will say, you get, we have ruled that it accrues this specific spiritual benefit, time off in purgatory couple things about this. Number one, you cannot buy pur time off of purgatory for somebody else. Your alms do not buy, and technically speaking, by the way, you're not buying time off of purgatory. But again, these are nuances that are lost. This is the reason, and you can thank the Reformation for this, this is the reason the church has more or less gotten away from this idea of indulgences. Now, you can get indulgences. I have gone out of my way to get them, in fact. Uh, Specifically, there was an indulgence that was set by Pope Francis where during the COVID pandemic, where if you said a rosary for the cure for the pandemic on a certain day and you uh, had gone to com and you had gone to confession and confessed your sins, then the temporal punishment would be wiped out. Right. So that so they are absolutely still around, still being chewed, even by this most liberal of modern popes. Uh, so. It is not true to say that the church has gone away from indulgences. However, they have gone away from connecting almsgiving to indulgences. And the reason for that is not because almsgiving is not a good work. It is giving money to the church to build a beautiful church in Rome, which is what most of the almsgiving at the time was for, is a good work. But because it was extremely ripe for corruption and ripe for misrepresentation. And this was well known at the time. John Hughes... Uh, Remember him? I mentioned I did not mention him last time, but I promised I would talk about him this time. We're going to get to him more later, because he becomes very prominent in the debates later. But John Hus actually preached against indulgences before Luther. 
and was criticized for that. But specifically, he was criticized for questioning the church's authority in granting them. So, all of this, Martin Luther writes 95 Theses. Now, the 95 Theses are actually against the indulgences. That is specifically what the 95 Theses are protesting against. They are not about sola fide. They are not about sola scriptura. Uh, they are not even really about the authority of the church, although that is in there. They are about, specifically, indulgences. Now, I say they're not... While well, Anthony's disconnected, uh, I did do a video where I re read out the 95 Theses. Do check that out if you're interested. It is entirely about per uh, 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 indulgences. Anthony! Anthony! Oh well, this stuff happens. Can you hear me again? I can. I'm going to connect through my phone hotspot in a moment to prevent the dying. Uh, where did I stop at? Because I don't know when it actually died. You were discussing that the uh, 95 Theses were entirely about uh, the indulgences, not some other subject that would come up later in his writing. Right. Not some of the other Protestant you know, subjects, I guess, is the way to put it. So, or things that were prominent in the Protestant Reformation. So, yeah, I'm slightly distracted because I'm making sure to set up my phone hotspot because my internet keeps dying and I don't want that to happen again. Uh, anyway, yeah, which is true. So the 95 theses were specifically directed against indulgences, but I'm being a little bit misleading when I say that they are, they aren't against church authority. That is in there, but it's somewhat implicit. Give me one second while I swap over... Ninety-five Martin Luther thesis on the wall. Ninety-five Martin Luther thesis. Take one. All right, I'm in. Okay. Ninety-four thesis on the wall. Now I'm connected to phone internet. Can you hear me? I can. All right. Hopefully the phone internet will not die. My phone connection is fine. It's my old phone internet. That's annoying. Uh -huh. Anyway. So that should be the last, fingers crossed, of the interruptions. Anyway, so. There is an implicit challenge to church authority within the 95 theses. I mean, there are 95 of them as well. So it, while it is somewhat implicit, it's definitely there. I do think that Luther knew that he would be causing a controversy, which is why he wanted to make sure that, like, Rome saw them and all these people saw them. I mean, if it was just a, you know, a little theological challenge, I don't think he would have been so insistent on getting it out to everyone. But that's not an inherently bad thing either. You know, it's fine to have... The thing about indulgences is, is that at the time, they were not very, uh, well, understood, right? Like, yeah. they were especially among the populace. Theologians were somewhat debating them. It was agreed that they were permitted and they had been around for a while, but they were not something that there was a robust theology behind. The robust theology of indulgences actually formed partially as a result of the corruption surrounding the Protestant Reformation as people tried to nail down exactly what they were. John Hus had criticized them. Erasmus, the scholar, uh, who has been mentioned before, has also criticized them. Uh, he is uh, somebody who spoke with Luther and who had communication with Luther. So criticism of indulgences on their own wasn't really enough to make you like an enemy of the church. What made you somebody who had to kind of have the be checked out was if you said, and therefore the church has no authority to give the indulgences, well, then you were messing with the authority of the church, and that was to make you a little bit more suspect. So, what happens as a result of the 95 Theses? Debates break out, they're rather explosive. A man named Johann Tetzel answers the scene. So, who is Johann Tetzel? Uh, Johann Tetzel is one, of actual, is one of the more important but shorter-lived figures of the Reformation. He was the indulgence collector in the region of Germany where Martin Luther lived. 
Uh, there was a lot of black libel and slander that was spread about uh, Tetzel in that time to the point where Luther actually regretted some of it later on, realizing that Tetzel was more the symptom than the cause of many of the problems and that it was kind of unfair to treat him as the cause, though Luther was quite brutal early on. Uh, Tetzel, though, to somewhat his credit, he was not a corrupt man. I will say that himself. He was not corrupt. So he wasn't making money off of the indulgences himself. He was a Dominican friar. I have often seen him called a friar. Friars don't necessarily have to be priests, though they can be, meaning I am not actually sure if Johann Tetzel is a priest. I've never seen him described as a priest, so I suspect no, but I can't confirm. Uh, he was, however, definitely uh, the man who was in charge, who had been put in charge of collecting indulgences by Arch Albrecht who, remember, had bought his archbishopric with the money funneled from the indulgences. So, what is Johann? Johann Tetzel is the person who writes the first public response to the 95 Theses. Now, for all of the bad reputation of Tetzel, some of it deserved, which we will get to soon, the response that he writes to Luther is actually not that bad. Like, he correctly sees the beginnings of Luther's more radical theological commitments. Or what would have been, you know, I am uh, admittedly stacking the, th the deck by calling them radical. So when I say that, just assume radical as, you know, compared to the time, right? So he is the first person to correctly see that there are implicit challenges to church authority here. Now, where was Tetzel wrong? So Tetzel thought that you could use indulgences to get loved ones out of purgatory. So, this was not true. Now, to be somewhat fair to Tetzel, it was being debated at the time. However, I will note that Cardinal Cajetan, who becomes one of Luther's opponents later on, condemns Tetzel here, and he does this before Luther's excommunication. So, which is notable, right? So, it was so not because... Luther's excommunication that he was condemned. So, par pardon me here. Where are you um, going? To so, with with this stuff, was how firm, explicitly firm, was indulgences, or are you telling us what the current theolog theology is? Oh, so what I'm saying is that the current theology on indulgences was kind of fuzzy at the time. The idea that the church could grant them was well established. Okay. That and why, you know, the power to bind and loose, that was well established. Could so, you use them by other people out of purgatory? That was being debated by some niche theologians, but it was ultimately condemned. Was it condemned during Tetzel's life? It was condemned during Tetzel's life before Luther was excommunicated by okay. Kashatan. So he would know that it was not a accepted practice to say or to believe that your uh, indulgence is would get a loved one out of uh, purgatory say that Tetzel might have genuinely believed that when he started preaching but it was like he was told it was wrong okay explicitly by a cardinal okay so he did know better than to say a, a indulgence Sorry, I just wanted to say that just to make sure that, like, when we talk about theology, there's kind of a continuum, and we are at one end of the continuum. Like, yeah, Paul absolutely. is at the other end of the continuum. What we know now in Say is Right Doctrine may literally not be known by some dude in the 11th century or the 15th century, uh, even if they were a scholar of the church. So I wanted right. to make sure I'm that we weren't saying... Fair. Yeah, sorry. Keep going. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to be entirely fair to Tetzel here. What I am saying is I think, I think that he genuinely believed that. And I think that when he said it, it was not a condemned theological opinion, but it was within his lifetime before Luther's excommunication. Gotcha. And specifically, by the way, because of Luther calling him out, so... You know, the fact, like, it got it into the public eye and it forced them to kind of make a ruling on it. Uh, 
it also, I would say that it was not like a well, uh, it was not like an established opinion. I would not say it was like the majority opinion of theologians and then the Vatican stepped in. It was just some theologians were coming out and going, hey, you know, you know, maybe you could use it for loved ones as well. And then, of course, the indulgent salesman, if you want to be uh, rather crass and call them that, fair or unfair, I'll just use that phrase for convenience's sake, you know, the indulgent salesman immediately took that and said, like, that'll get more indulgences if we could sell it that way, and then start spreading that around. Like, I would not say that it was, you know, the theology of Rome at any point. I'll put it that way. Right. Does that make sense? It does. Okay, so moving on from that, but it is important, so I'm glad that you asked me to clarify, because that is actually, like, an important point, getting the timeline and stuff like that right. So it was being debated at the time, and Luther is very, is a very, very good writer, which, by the way, he actually is. Uh, yes. I will say that myself. He's an entertaining writer. Uh, he reminds me of St. Jerome, who is also an extremely entertaining writer. Uh, in other words, he's very mean. <laughs> But he's very good at being mean. Anyway, Luther, is, and he gains like a fo kind of a cult following around him. Cult following, again, is stacking the deck a little bit. It's not really fair. But I mean he got a very uh, strong following, I guess, is a better way of putting it. Right? So Luther gets a very strong following around him who support his teachings on this and who, uh, and who agree with Luther. And then Luther start to get a little cocky, I would say. So, first thing is, his early letters, he praises the Pope. Uh, he is, in fact, pretty effusive in his praise of the Pope. I will say this, too. Leo X, I believe he was. Leo X gets a bad rap, historically speaking, and it is not entirely fair. As far as the Renaissance Popes go, I would put him at about average. Now, the Renaissance Popes were an interesting group. They were corrupt, some were horrible, but not all of them were horrible. And some of the corrupt ones were also people who were genuinely trying. I would put Leo X as a roughly middling pope, actually. Like, I don't think he was notably super corrupt or anything like that. And I don't think that he was notably, uh, you know, he wasn't somebody who was having, like, some of the truly horrendous popes. He wasn't having orgies in the Vatican. He wasn't selling the papacy like Bandic the Ninth, and he did some good things. And he, and I believe too, that he was genuinely trying in his role as pontiff as well. Like he was not just using it for the political clout. I do think he took the idea of being pope seriously. He had a good reputation at the time as well. This is what Luther says in his early letters. He praises the pope's holiness, but then the pope doesn't back him. Luther's tune changes, and he immediately starts going off about how the Pope is horrible. Now, there was something else that happened at the time as well. So, you will not see this talked about among Catholics anymore, because it was debunked literally at around this period of time. But there was something called the Donation of Constantine, that the Emperor Constantine, like, don't, I don't remember it exactly, because again, it's not something that Catholics talk about anymore, so it's not something that I've done significant research into. But it was this idea that, like, Constantine donated some of the land that the Vatican was on, and that this was, like, one of the basis for Rome to claim its authority. Uh, the Vatican no longer m mentions this, like, at all. Uh, it is not ever used in arguments anymore, because the donation of Constantine was found at the time to be a forgery. And it was. It was a forgery, by the way. Like, it was entirely forged. Uh, there was no donation of Constantine. It never happened. And you will not see any Catholic apologist, anybody who is arguing in favor of the papacy, ever bring up the donation of Constantine anymore because it didn't happen. But the church had been, or at least, I guess I should not say the church per se, uh, <coughs> factions of the church had been to get to push. Now, this is one of the reasons that Rome was the center of the Christian world, right? Like, and this is why, you know, the Pope was centered in Rome because of the donation of Constantine. And when it came out to be a forgery, uh, this kind of was one of the things that disenchanted Luther. So he starts attacking the Pope. And 
a, this is uh, the facts of the matter followed by my commentary. So my commentary on it. Uh, number one, I do not think that the claims of the papacy, for obvious reasons, depend on the donation of Constantine. I only learned about it in my research of the Reformation. It is not used by Catholic apologists now. Uh, so I don't think that the claims depend on it. With that said, you could see why somebody at the time would be very disenchanted to learn that this was uh, something that came out as false. Uh, number two, I will also point out that Luther criticizing the Pope was not enough to make him persona non grata in the church. There were anti-papal factions. So, in a relatively short period of time beforehand, a few hundred years, like, or maybe a hundred years, uh, was the Western Schism. So, in the Western Schism, there were at one point three anti-popes, people who falsely claimed the papacy before it was resolved at a council, and this kind of started the Renaissance papacy, uh, with Pope Martin V. So, the Western Schism was a very disenchanting experience for a lot of Europe. It's honestly an underrated historical event in some ways, in how it laid the groundwork for the Protestant Reformation. Uh, there were people who, conciliarism, I should, uh, I'll say, which is the position that councils are the highest authority in the church and not the pope, and not, or not the pope and councils, which is something along the lines of like the modern Catholic position. Uh, conciliarism was a very popular opinion after the Western Schism under the theory that, well, obviously, you know, we can't trust the pope, right? Like, it right. didn't, you know, it let the anti-popes. So, conciliarism was looked at as, like, the alternative. Uh, it was still, like, a popular opinion at that point in time, and something of a legitimate, though not, not of a light theological opinion by the Catholic Church at that time. You could argue, though I wouldn't, but I can see somebody making the argument that Erasmus was a conciliarist. I don't really think he was. But I can see why somebody would say that. Going by his writings. So, all right, you have conciliarism as a position. Luther criticizes the Pope, this gets him even more followers. And he's not yet on the outs with the church. But then he starts saying some more things. Some more really what they would call odd stuff. So, I'm going to pivot now. Instead of talking about the direct historical events, I'm going to talk about what I would consider to be the two main hallmarks of the Protestant Reformation, the things that, if you talk to Protestants now, they would say are the two most important things, for the most part, obviously, because painting all Protestants with one brush is always a mistake. <laughs> but they would, for the most part, say the most important thing to come out of the Reformation, which are his two doctrines. I call them his, but we'll get to that. I just say it for convenience of language. Of uh, Sola Scriptura and Sola Fide. So, sola fide first. Now, I am of the opinion, and I do think that there has been a lot of uh, good stuff talked about. I am of the opinion, or good stuff, good progress made on this front, that sola fide is... It's the doctrine of faith alone, right? That is the Latin for sola fide. So, I am of the opinion that it's reconcilable between the Protestant and the Catholic churches, that there is common ground between the Catholic and the, the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches. The Lutheran joint document on justification that came out in, I want to say, the 90s. Uh, could be wrong, could have been a little later. But the Lutheran Catholic joint document on justification was a huge step forward in this. I think that there was, in terms of the doctrine of sola fide, a lot of Catholic and Protestant talking past each other. Now, what Luther was concerned about was the Catholic, cent the Catholic centrality, at least he eventually turned into this. I wouldn't say he focused on this early on, but it did turn into this eventually. The Catholic centrality on the sacraments, uh, and the seven sacraments of the church, Luther eventually eliminates all of them except for baptism and the Eucharist. Uh, to my knowledge, I might be missing something, but I think those are the only two that he keeps. And later Protestants will even kind of get rid of them, at least as sacraments, 
as something that actually has efficacious grace is the theological term for it. You know, they would say that baptism does not actually uh, impute grace, that the Eucharist does not actually impute grace, that you need that faith first for it to do anything, right? And John Hus was also kind of close to this point. Uh, I would not say that uh, John Hus and Martin Luther agreed entirely on this. Actually, we don't really have that much of, like, what John Hus actually taught, oddly enough. Like, we have very few of his, like, writings. And he also denies, like, explicitly denies a lot of the charges that were made against him. So John Hus is kind of hard to pin down, even though the Moravian Church claims him. Uh, they didn't have the but, printing press or anything like that, so it was very hard for them to yeah, material. Yeah, exactly. So John Hus is a little bit hard to pin down. Martin Luther, on the other hand, had the printing press, so he is. we can follow his line of thought quite clearly. Uh, however, I am going to say this. This is, I will, uh, somewhat of a Catholic take. I do think that, uh, I will say in terms of the doctrine of sola fide, that there is a quote-unquote Catholic formulation of it. So the question of, as uh, Ben has asked me multiple times, what comes first, faith or works? The answer is faith. This is explicit and it is clear in the Bible. Faith comes first, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, but that's true. However, the question is, you know, as my good friend Ben likes to ask, which comes first, faith? Just, uh, <laughs> and it's true, faith comes first. But, I would not say that that's the end of the story. I am not a once saved, always saved, uh, right? I don't think that that's supported in scripture. Uh, at best, I would say that it is, like, not contradicted in scripture. But then I am also not sola scriptura. We will get there in a moment. We're still on sola fide. Uh, so... I would say that faith comes first. There is a way that you can word faith alone in such a way that I think at the very least the Lutheran Catholics can understand it and say and agree, right? Mm -hmm. So, whether all Protestants could is obviously not true. Whether Lutherans and Catholics could, well, we do have the joint document. And while not all Lutherans agree with it, uh, it is definitely a... It's definitely notable that a lot of a lot of Lutherans and a lot of Catholics agree with it. I would hold to everything in the document. I know a lot of Protestants who would as well. I also know that even among certain, again, this is you got to be very careful with Protestantism because it's so broad. Certain Protestants who would say, "Okay, yeah, so you disagree on certain parts of our interpretation of faith alone, but you agree enough on the important stuff, like that you need faith." then I'm not going to necessarily fight it with you, right? Like, yeah, okay, that's enough. I can understand that. I wouldn't necessarily agree with your interpretation, but it makes sense, and it's not necessarily contradictory. You still love Jesus. You know, so that's another way to look at it as well. Uh, it is worth noting, too, that sola fide, the doctrine, when we get to Trent later, and we're going to do Trent. I am actually looking forward to Trent. Trent is super fascinating. Uh when we get to Trent later and they actually start discussing, like, faith alone versus faith and works versus, you know, the Catholic versus Christ and positions on justification, the there was almost a fist fight that broke out at the Council of Trent over whether or not Luther's interpretation was correct or not. Like, it actually nearly came to blows. Uh, so I certainly would not say that sola fide was something that was obviously wrong either, which I have heard Catholics say. But I think that there are some subtleties to the teaching that make it not so. Like, I don't think, for example, that Luther would deny that good works are important. I mean, it would be impossible to if you knew anything about the Bible since they're talked about frequently. Uh, but that doesn't mean that he would say that they are central to salvation. So, the Catholic position, this is where I will go on record as disagreeing, even actually with some Catholic apologists. Like, I've seen the Catholic apologist Trent Horn say he was uncomfortable with this, and I will even disagree with him. And I'm definitely going to go off the reservation with some Protestants here. 
And I, I think that the formulation faith and works, you know, instead of faith alone, I think that that is a perfectly valid way of formulating the doctrine. And the reason that I say that is because this is how it is said in James. Now, you might go, well, James is, you know, means something slightly different, whatever. Okay, fine. Then I mean it the, exactly the way that James means it. Whatever James is trying to say, when he says faith and works and not by faith alone, I agree with him. And I agree, you know, when Paul says that uh, we are saved by faith and not by works, that no man may boast, I agree with that insofar as it is reconciled with James's formulation that we are saved by faith and works and not by faith alone. So, I do think that the form, that saying, no, it can't be faith and works, well, I think that obviously there is a way where you can understand it as faith and works, because that is how... James understood it. That's not to say that every every understanding of the way that you of faith and works is going to be accurate. Just as not every understanding of faith alone, like a radical faith alone, that says, "Oh well, now that you're saved, you can murder someone and you'll still go to heaven," which some incredibly radical Protestants do believe. It's a very minority view, to be clear, but it's out there. Versus a Catholic who says. Well, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you act, as long as you're a good person, then you'll still be saved. That is also wrong, and that's also said by some misled Catholics. Uh, it, is, it has been said to me to my face. Yeah, and it absolutely, and that's also wrong. Right, right. No, no, so I'm, I'm, that, I'm just reinforcing it. I agree with you absolutely. Right. So those two. So I think that those you get those two radical ends of the spectrum there. The radical, what you would call, well, I'm going to make up a term literally just now. This is not the term that the people who use it, but I don't really have, would you, but I don't actually have a lot of respect for this position. Like, super sola fide, where you go, you have faith once, and then you're just saved. And then you could kill a man, and you're still saved. No, that's nonsense. Uh, versus Catholics who would go, oh, but it doesn't, you know, even if you don't believe in Jesus, even if you don't, you know, even if you don't think that Jesus is God or believe in Christ, but you do good works, well, then you're still saved because it's not by faith alone, right? No, that's also wrong. That is not supported by Scripture. It's all, it, and for that matter, it's not supported by tradition either. Both of these are incorrect understandings. But I would say that I don't think that we should entirely reject the formulation of faith and works, not by faith alone, because that is the way that James words it. So, that is my opinion on the sola fide controversy. I think there is a lot of common ground for dialogue on that. I think that there is an understanding that a lot of Protestants and Catholics could come to where they agree on a lot of the essentials. Now, sola scriptura. Sola scriptura is tougher. So, here is where I will give the... This is the ground that I will give on sola scriptura. So, first off, my understanding of sola scriptura and again it is difficult to say if like the quote-unquote protestant understanding because there are so many different types of protestants out there but my understanding of sola scriptura and as luther understood it to my knowledge if i understood him correctly uh, is that scripture is the sole infallible rule of faith so if you have an opinion on faith it needs to ha have some sort of support directly in scripture and the more support the better you know there are things that are implicit in scripture but if something is implicit but debated then it's not that important uh this is again like kind of an oversimplified way of doing it but for as an example of this the perpetual virginity of mary um and i'm talking about by the way from the protestant view by the way so the keeping that in mind so from the view of a sola scriptura Protestant, if you can make a case for the perpetual virginity of Mary in scripture, well, it's not explicit anyway. It would at the at best be implicit and arguably contradicted. And it's also not central to salvation anyway. So there's no real reason for us to believe it. So that would be something like a sola scriptura. Uh, when, when there's of, countering information. Right. So that would be something like a sola scriptura view of like the perpetual virginity of Mary. Similarly... When you talk about the Eucharist, uh, is the Eucharist actually the body and blood of Christ? Well, uh, the thing is that 
even if it is a metaphor, it is not something that is essential to salvation to believe because they never say faith is what's essential to salvation. Faith is central. So because faith is central, then the Eucharist, even though it is very important, is not central. And there is a debate that can be had on the subject with scriptural support on both sides. Again, this is from what I would call the Protestant perspective. So it's not something that we should concern ourselves over in terms of, like, handing out anathemas. So that's, and the other thing, too, is that the final, the final source of authority where you go to, because it is God-breathed, and because it is the only thing that we know of that is God-breathed, uh, I guess that's another way of putting it as well. So this is steel manning the case to the extent that I can that I understand it. Uh, to the extent that we know anything is God breathed, we know that Scripture is God breathed. Because of that, we have to make it the authority. There is nothing else that can be any other authority. We have to compare to Scripture to make sure it is not contradicted in the Scriptures, because the Scriptures are breathed out by God. Nothing else is to our knowledge. Now, that's not to say necessarily that there is definitely absolutely nothing else, but we can't know it because it's not mentioned in the scriptures, which is the one thing that we have on record that we that says it's not brief. So we would have to compare it to the scripture first anyway to make sure. So scripture is the final authority. That's sola scriptura. It is not the church. The church is not an authority. The magisterium is not an authority. Extra biblical traditions can't be an authority. Because, again, we don't have anything saying that those traditions are God-breathed. We do have something saying that Scripture is God-breathed. Now, what this all means practically varies wildly depending on the Protestant church that you're talking to. Uh, you will have people who I have spoken to who have said to my face that they think that Catholics are going to hell because they are adding things to the Gospels and that they have a workspace salvation. Versus, you will have Protestants who go... Yeah, that stuff that you're adding, I don't think is necessary, but I don't think it necessarily contradicts the gospel either. And you still love Jesus, and that's the important thing. Those are the spectrums that you get. Catholics are going to hell because they believe this extra biblical stuff on one hand, versus I don't think that this extra biblical stuff is supported, and I disagree with some of it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be damned. However, this is not something that is consistent among the Protestant churches. Uh, it... There is such a wide disparity here on what sola scriptura means in a practical sense. Though I think most of them would agree with how I put it in a definitional sense, right, of scripture as the final authority on faith and morals. Uh, now, as far as Luther goes, he sort of develops into this because he starts off again praising the Pope and criticizing the Pope, then getting very disillusioned. He brings up what he believes in his famous debate with Johann Eck. We'll get there, and I'll actually talk about that in a moment, because it's very, very important. Uh, in his debate with Johann Eck, he states that he believes that the popes and the councils contradict each other at times, which means that it can't be God-breathed. You know, there can't be any uh, godly authority in there, because they contradict. Is Luther's argument that he makes to Eck. Uh, and he cites the Western Schism as one of his reasons for this. That, like, there were things that were said at the Western Schism that were contradicted by later popes. So, to my knowledge, again, I'm going a little bit off of memory, but it's basically this. So, going back to all of that, uh, where I would agree with the Protestant position to a point is this. There, was a, there is a writer, his name is James Shastek. Uh, he, is a, he is a teacher. He has a great, great website called tomism.wordpress.com. And he had an article on this where he said that the problem is that uh, Catholics emphasize the community and de-emphasize the importance of Scripture and Protestants emphasize the importance of Scripture and de-emphasize the importance of a single community. And then the two kind of uh, started talking past each other to the point where no reconciliation ended up being possible. And the only person who could save us now is God. Uh, that is something that I could agree with, at least to a point. So, yes, I would agree that there was something of a DM emphasis on the laity reading scripture that the church got back to in later years. Uh, there was a point, it is true, during the Protestant Reformation, 
where the church was very carefully regulating who could read scripture, I would actually agree with the church on this, because at the time they were trying to make sure that they were not t reading Bibles that were skewed towards the Protestant point of view. You still get this now, people who will criticize a Bible as either Catholic or Protestant, and how they, for example, translate the word kacharitamine in uh, Luke when uh, Mary is called, uh, when the angel greets Mary. She is either called full of grace, that is the Catholic, the translation that is used by most Catholic Bibles, or she is called favored one, that is the translation used by most Protestant Bibles. So, you know, the disagreements echo through the centuries. Uh, however, I do think that, and this happened in Vatican II, by the way, that the re-emphasis on the lady reading the Bible is a good thing. I'm glad that we've gotten to that point. Uh, now, where I would disagree is that I am not a soul, I do not agree with Sola Scriptura. Unfortunately, unlike Sola Fide, where I do think that there is a lot of common ground there, I think that the common ground stops at, I understand that the Catholics might have de-emphasized scripture at one point too much. I do not think as a, uh, as a base of authority it is coherent. I don't think it works historically. I don't think it's even supported overwhelmingly in scripture. So I would say that my position on it, and I think that the Catholic position, uh, which, by the way, doesn't necessarily contradict the Orthodox position, though I'll talk about that in a second, is that Jesus Christ established a church. Uh, he taught people. He taught apostles. The apostles had authority. The apostles were given the ability to pass on that authority through the laying on of hands. This uh, was the priesthood uh, with, with the three levels of holy orders of deacon, of deacon bishop, priest. Uh, that authority ultimately got slowly more codified into something with a real hierarchy, and this turned into the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church before their schism. So where I would say that the Orthodox differ from the Catholic Church is that I would say that the Catholic view of authority is something like scripture plus tradition plus magisterium. Now, you will hear apologists for the Catholic Church point out that scripture is actually part of tradition, uh, but for ease of communication, I will separate the two. Uh, you know, sacred tradition as separate from sacred scripture. How about that? And plus the magisterium. In other words, the teaching authority of the church to decide on controversial issues and to state what is and isn't essential teaching. Now, the magisterium is the pope and the college of cardinals and the body of bishops as they meet in councils. The orthodox view of the authority, which I think is uh, at least coherent, is that there is, is its sacred tradition plus sacred scripture, but I don't think that they have a magisterium in the way that the Catholics do. They can't really organize as the Catholic Church can, because you know they don't have a pope who can call a council, and they are not all in unity in that way. So they don't really have a teaching body. However, what they would say is that their authority comes from the church, the bishops who met at the early councils, and now they would say that, well, Christi the Christians aren't united, so we can't really have any more councils that have that sort of binding authority anymore. Ever since, you know, you'll hear various answers. Uh, I've heard the first seven ecumenical councils. I would say if I were Orthodox, which I am not, I would have dated it at the Council of Chalcedon when the Coptic... Orthodox Church, which, by the way, is still around, uh, split off. You know, why aren't you dating it from them? And some do, to be fair. Uh, you know, then it's not the full church making decisions anymore. Uh, but they don't have a magisterial authority that has the ability to rule on issues. The Catholic Church does. I think that the Orthodox position is at least historically, like, they have the, they, they have the structure of the historical church right, and they have an apostolic structure. And the Catholic position with the magisterium um, is obviously the one that I personally think is correct. Uh, I say personally, it's not that I don't think that there's an objective answer here, but I am not an, ex I am not an expert, and I emphasize the fact that there is a 
vast and complicated debate on the subject. Uh, also, I'm not here to debate Catholic versus Orthodox. I'm here to talk about Catholic versus the Protestant views. So the Catholic view of authority is that Jesus set up a church. We see this in the Gospels. He gave that church the authority to define who was and was not in it. He gave that church the authority to uh, create new ministers with the laying on of hands. He talks about only one singular church. Uh, I have had the discussion. Technically, there are 24 small C churches in union with the Church of Rome. Uh, the word that the term that is used is in essentials unity, in non essentials uh, charity, which I would agree with. For example, many people don't know that in the Ukrainian Catholic Church, at the Union of Brest, the commentary that they made on purgatory in the Union of Brest was that we won't argue about it anymore because they disagreed on various aspects of purgatory. And uh, they just decided that it was not worth the argument. It was better for union to happen than for these specific points of doctrine to be infallibly defined. So my issue with Sola Scriptura, I have a few, but it could be summed up as any argument that you would make in favor of scripture as the authority that we need to be followed would also <coughs> work for the church hierarchy. So I have no reason not to believe in the church hierarchy and thus the authority of the church if I'm going to believe in sola scriptura anyway. I do think that it is backed up at least somewhat in scripture, though it is implicit. The reason I think it is implicit in scripture is because the church was around at the time. Like, there was no reason to make it explicit in Scripture. Uh, Jesus Christ establishes the church in Scripture, and that church is what is operating when these books come out. So why would you, you know, you wouldn't need to convince people that it was just this one church. This was the church. So, as far as Scripture alone as the source, uh, I think that once you make the argument that, well, Scripture is the only thing that can be considered God-breathed, you go, well, then why do you consider these books God-breathed? And then you get into what's the source of that authority. And then you get into, okay, so all of the things like, you know, the ascent of the faithful is one that I've heard. Various aspects to which you go, right, but the hierarchy also had the ascent of the faithful. The church itself had the ascent of the faithful. So it clearly needs to be more than that. Well, it says itself that's God breathed. Okay, sure. Like, it says that some of the scriptures are God breathed. It certainly doesn't date all of the New Testament books. This does not get into the issues of how do you define the Deuterocanon. So, by the way, it's worth noting. Uh, I'm going to mention that briefly because we'll get to it later. I actually only have a few more lands and I need to get to the debate with Eck and Luther. Uh, in terms of the Deuterocanon, the. Deuter the Deuterocanon slash Apocrypha, those books of the Old Testament that are not included in uh, in a uh, Protestant canon uh, in the Protestant canon of Scripture, the Deuterocanon slash Apocrypha apocryphal books. So Luther did not take the Deuterocanon out of the Bible. Uh, let us be clear here. He did not even say that they were not inspired. What he said was that they were on a lower level than the Proto Canon. So I am going to say something that is both positive and negative here. On the positive side, I don't think that Luther was necessarily going against any teachings to do this. There was some debate with the Deuterocanon that was not present for what was what is now called the Protocanon. Uh, that debate had been around since around the time of Jerome, and there were a few people who dissented and thought that they were at least not on the level of the main books of Scripture, which is what Luther was saying. I will also say that the Council of Trent does not rule on the issue. They confirm that everything is scripture, but they don't say whether the Deuterocanon can't, should or should not be considered on, a, on the same or lower level than the Protocanon. Now I will disagree by saying that, in my personal opinion, I think that we should understand the Deuterocanon as being on the same level as the Protocanon. I don't, I am not convinced by arguments to the contrary, having seen several debates on the topic. Uh, I don't think that there's any real reason to accept that the Protocanon is more inspired than the Deuterocanon. Uh, now, I'll close it off by talking about the famous debate with Eck. 
Now, my I'm talking more about theological issues than Ben did, so I did not get as much into the history. Partially this is because, again, I don't have notes this time around uh, to organize me, but oh well. So, the debate with Eck. So, Cardinal Eck, Johann Eck, he was a prominent theologian at the time. He was an opponent of Luther. And Johann Eck was also very well educated. Now, this debate with Luther is a very famous debate, depending on who you talk to. Uh, both sides supposedly did very well, though it is un undisputed that Luther came across as uh, increasingly angry as the debate went on. Luther, one of Luther's flaws was that he had a temper on him. Uh, what does that mean? Nothing, really. It's just interesting. Historical note. Uh, anyway, supposedly both sides do well. Uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia says that Luther's anger got a hold of him, but it's the Catholic Encyclopedia. I also read a book written from the Catholic perspective that describes Luther as performing quite admirably in the debate. But Eck gets what he wants. So Eck was trying to get Luther to admit that he did not accept the authority of the church councils. Now, not accepting the authority of the Pope, remember, was one thing. Conciliarism was an opinion that was still believed by a fair number of people and could even be backed. Not believing in the authority of the councils, however, uh, well, that was extreme. And he gets Luther to admit it. <coughs> and, then, and then X says, famously, and I'm paraphrasing, then, you know, he says, well, then I can't really trust it unless it's in the Bible. And Eck responds, well, then, Luther, Arius thought the same way. You're a heretic. And considering it kind of job well done, that I did my job, he goes back to Rome to report on it. And Luther's excommunication is all but inevitable at that point, And he is excommunicated. So I'm also going to change my own opinion. And this opinion was changed from research. I originally said I did not think that uh, Luther should be should have been excommunicated, that it was an own goal. I actually think nowadays that he should have been. Now, that's not to say that I think he should have been executed, and by the way, he was not. In fact, they never even ruled on Luther's execution. Uh, interestingly, which some people don't realize, but he was never, uh, he, he was never convicted in anything that was considered to be worthy of execution. Uh, but I do think he should have been excommunicated, and the reason is very simple. Whether you agree with Luther or whether you disagree with Luther, the Catholic Church has the right to define for itself what it is. And Luther very explicitly, very clearly, and very publicly put himself outside of that. Now, you might say, well, Luther is still a Christian. I agree with him. That is fine. But then you are not a Catholic. <laughs> uh, Luther, for whatever you thought of him, you might agree with Sola Scriptura, you might agree with Sola Fide, you might think that his uh, attack on the corruption of the clergy was necessary, valid, and important, uh, but if you believe that the authority, that Rome does not have the authority to rule on doctrine, if you believe that the final source of authority is Scripture, then you don't believe in what the Catholic Church believes, and the Catholic Church is allowed to define what the Catholic Church believes. And Luther w did not believe that thing. So, I do think that Luther had to be excommunicated. I don't think there was really a way around it. And I don't think Luther was trying to find a way around it. Although, I do think he was somewhat blindsided by being forced to admit that in the debate. I don't think that was the plan. Um, but I also don't think that Luther was necessarily particularly fussed, like... When he was excommunicated, I don't think that he burst into tears. He knew that it was coming. Uh, the excommunication itself is kind of a not that important of a historical event, weirdly, weirdly enough. Exerge Domine doesn't really talk a lot about the doctrine because the Pope was not debating Luther. The Pope was just pointing out, I'm the Pope and these are the things you disagree with. And they were. They were the things that Luther disagreed with. Now, there's some stuff in there that people think is kind of weird nowadays. I would love to go through Sergei Domine in detail one day. Uh, but overall, they're really just not that concerned with, like, debating the doctrines of Lutheranism. He's just condemning Luther as a heretic, using his authority from the perspective of the Catholic Church, which he is allowed to do.
And we are at nine o'clock, so that's my hour up. Uh, I got kind of hung up on the theology of it, but I think that's important because, again, I have a very specific goal. My goal was to say, if you are a Catholic and you agree that the church was corrupt and you agree that the reformers were uh, people who were trying to save souls, then why would you still be Catholic? I'm trying to explain why. Now, next stream, Council of Trent. Be there. Be square. It's yeah. fun stuff. It actually is. Council of Trent is super interesting. Oh, I will yeah. probably have notes for that one. <laughs> I, I'll definitely be better prepared. Unfortunately, uh, I've just been blindsided all week, and things have been a little bit difficult. But Yeah, some uh, things are outside of my control. I'd have liked to have had notes, and it took me a little bit off track, but I'm satisfied with what I talked about today. Yep. Uh, I will have a special episode with uh, Jim Brayfogle, Lord Willing, uh, on Tuesday. Um, we'll also, next week, uh, it will be an Anthony stream as Lord Willing. Uh, we'll be, I'll be in John C. Wright's uh, Wonderful Game Time. Uh, and then the week after, we might have somebody new. I don't know. I'll reach out. Uh, we didn't really get a lot of views on this one, but that's all right. This is kind of a... Uh, make work one like we have to go over the beginning of the reformation we have to go over the beginning disagreements i did do a video uh where i read out the 95 theses uh and i'll probably well i mean if anthony wants to do a video about it that's fine too but uh do a video on exurge domine uh just because it is sort of part of the dialogue there like these things that happened are the turning points, even though everything around them was moving forward anyway. Codifying something means something moves forward. Do you have any final words, Anthony? Uh, I would have liked to have had my notes prepared so I could cover a little bit more ground than I did, but I got through the things that I wanted to, which is, you know, like I said, in a, in a sense, our goals were not necessarily, like, opposed to each other. They were in one sense, but in another sense, like, you could affirm what I'm saying to at least a point, and I can affirm what you're saying to a point without, a, yeah. you know, without either of us converting, right? Right. And that's the thing. Like, even though, uh, you know, I do view some of, some of Anthony's views as, as quite uh, unorthodox uh, and not in keeping with Scripture and whatever you want to throw into it, most of it comes from his Catholicism, not his faith in Christ. And I'm sure it's something similar with Anthony for me. Uh, the standards that we have for convincing each other of the other's position are not capable or within the hands of each other to give. <coughs> for example, he will not, through Scripture, and only Scripture, belabor the authority of the Roman Catholic Church, which is my standard for changing my doctrine. Yeah. And, uh, by the way, I will confirm what Ben is saying here, saying, like, yeah, I think that that's, uh, <laughs> from my perspective, anyway, that's, like, an unfair judgment. It's like, so you're going to ask me to prove that sola scriptura is not true using scripture alone. That doesn't make sense to me. But I get Ben's point. If you do believe sola scriptura is true, well, then you would have to use scripture alone. Yep. And it's, it's not because, you know, I'm a dick requiring a priori uh, instructions. It's more because the st this is such an important issue that not having clear standards on salvation, on what church you go to, is entirely antithetical to how Christians should live. Ultimately... Even though most of the people involved in the Reformation were godless uh, German peasants, uh, godless not because they were peasants, but because they were German, uh, the... Yeah, uh, <laughs> well, look at Luther's uh, famous Luther's document against the murderous thieving hordes of peasants. I read that it. That is a real document. It's great. <laughs> uh, but it's... it's uh, like It sounds like a joke, but it's not a joke. You're actually serious. <laughs> yeah, it's, I read a bit of it. Uh, on the stream earlier, uh, but the, well, I'm going to try to say, but the idea that I or Anthony or other people could take our souls and our immortal, uh, eternal damnation or salvation in hand on a whim is absolutely disgusting to me. 
these things are serious, and they are serious disagreements. You know, even though I, I don't doubt Anthony's salvation, I do seriously see how Catholic doctrine could lead somebody away from salvation. Just like a Catholic could say, well, you know, you're not meeting XYZ requirements in the faith and works equation. You know, I'm being simplified. Or, you know, they could look at the Jehovah's Witnesses, which are a cult, which are recognized as a cult by most, you know, Christian denominations, and say, well, this is what Protestants believe. You know, technically, even though Mormonism is a cult, it is also a Protestant denomination. Sadly. <sighs> though it's, oh, it's its own thing at this point. Excuse me. So, you know, there's... That and I would not consider the Mormons uh, Christians, properly speaking. No, no, they're not Christians. But what I'm saying is, they're the same way as, like, the Branch Davidians are quote-unquote Christian. You know, technically, the Branch Davidians used to be, that's Waco, uh, used to be, you know, some obscure Seventh-day Adventist cult of a cult of a cult. Like, it's like five cults down. It's cults all the way down, just like the Turtles. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, so yeah, I want to thank you all for joining. I'm going to cut off the stream and I'm probably going to get a Emo's Pizza or something. Happy Father's Day, and I uh, hope to see you guys next week. Woohoo.